Yep, thank you for that. So thank you for the benefits uh, of those uh, that will be following along on YouTube. This is the data science uh, learning uh, community and we are going through the introduction uh, to statistical uh, learning book. And today we'll be looking at chapter 10 of the book, which is about uh, deep learning. And for the learning objective in which we'll be covering today, uh, we'll look at uh, how to describe the structure of a single layer neural network. We're also going to describe the structure of a multi-layer neural network. Then we are going to describe the structure of a convolutional uh, neural network. We're also going to describe the structure of a recurrent uh, neural network. And also, at the end, we compare deep learning to simpler uh, models. So we are also going to recognize the process by which uh, neural networks are fit. Then at the end, we explain the double uh, descent uh, phenomenon. So basically, that uh, is uh, a rundown of the running learning objective, what will be going uh, over in our discussion uh, of the chapter today. So in the introduction part, uh, they basically talk about that deep learning is an, is an area of research in machine learning that is new name of neural network. So the new name is always is, uh, is neural network. So since, and this was in existence uh, since the eighties, when, when it first arose, then neural network improved in algorithms, methodology, and was followed by other techniques such as uh, the support uh, vector machines, which is what we look at uh, last week. So we also look at boosting and random forest to then become deep learning. So the combination of all this is what uh, results to what we have as deep learning uh, today. And the structure of the model calculation is widely used uh, for, for image and video classification, for speech, and also for, for text uh, modeling. Okay. So in this uh, neural network, so there are two parts. We have the multi-layer uh, neural network, but the first part we'll be looking at is the, is the single layer uh, neural network. So they said, let's consider a data set uh, that is made up of P predictors. So in this, we have X, which is our predictor variable, which we have X1 down to what XP. And we then build a nonlinear uh, function, which is our f of x, to predict our response uh, variable, uh, which is given by this uh, function, which is f of x beta 0 plus the summation of this, where we have beta k, h k um, of what x, where h of x of x is the expression of the word, the even layer because in a neural network, we have three different things we are looking at. We are looking at the input, which is the, the predictors. We also have the, the hidden layer. Then we also have the, the output, which is our response uh, variable, which we'll see as we proceed in the discussion. So we have a transformation of inputs named as A of K, function of X and X, and K activation, which is from one to what K, which is not directly observed. So here we have our activation function, which is given like this, which is a function H of K, which is our hidden layer of X. So this is, is going to give us the, the activation functions. And then we identify the activation of a nonlinear transformation of a linear uh, function, which is our G of Z. So the activation function, which I said earlier on is, uh, is given by this uh, formula. So we also went, they also went further to, uh, uh, to add uh, more uh, functions to, the, to, the, to define the activation function. So then to obtain an output layer, which is a linear model that uses these activations, inputs resulting in a function of which is f of x. So f of x 
is given as beta zero plus beta k and a of k, which is our f of x, which is our, our predictor uh, variable in our model. So each, so each a, a of k, which is our activation function, is a different transformation of our hidden layer. It's a different transformation of the hidden layer in the neural network. So here we have beta zero to what beta k, which is giving us w1 of zero to what wp, which, which, which need to be estimated from, from our data in which we are feeding in uh, into the model. So what about the activation function? There are various options, uh, but, they, they, but they, they do explain that the most ones are the, the sigmoid, which is given by these equations. And also we have the rectified, uh, the ReLU, which stands for the rectified linear uh, unit, which is given by this equation. And for the rectified linear unit, where Z is less than zero, okay? And where Z is greater than zero, where Z is greater than zero, we can see that our value, they are all uh, positive. The values are all positive. You can see where Z is less than zero and where Z is greater than zero, where we compare uh, the performance of both the sigmoid and the rectified uh, linear units. So they also went further to say that this is this is a structure of a single layer neural network. Here we can see the layer inputs, the hidden layers, and also the output uh, layer. So here we have the input layer in our in our neural network, which is x1 to what x4, which is the input. Because and this input is what we refer to as our predictor uh, variable. Then we also have the hidden layer. So we have the hidden layer, which is A1, A2, A3, A4 to what A5. These are the hidden layer. So within this hidden layer, so we, we move to the output layer in the model, which is our response variable, which is giving us Y. Because in every model, we, we have set of predictors, but in the neural network, they just brought in an, the hidden layer in into that model. So from there, we have to move to the response, which is our uh, response variable. So they say that the parameters can be retrieved with back propagation, which optimize uh, the weight, which optimize the weight coefficient, uh, which is W of KJ and the biases for the intercept, which is W of KO. We will see about later in this note. So here they gave an example uh, of a of a neural uh, network using the dosage uh, data sets. So here in this uh, flow charts, uh, they gave the our predictors where we are starting from the predicted variable, which is the dosage. Okay. So within this predictor variable, we have some various weights. We have some various weight variable. Here we have minus 34.4, we have 2.14, and we also have some biases, and we also have our response. So if we pick this dosage, and we multiply it by negative minus 34.4, then we add 2.14, we are going to arrive at this uh, curve. We are going to have this curve that we have here. Okay, so but. If we have our dosage our, as our predictors, so if we multiply it by a certain value of minus 2.52, then we add this value, which is 1.29. I think we are going to arrive at this other curve that we have here. Okay, so that's the value we have from here. If we now pick that value, then we multiply it by this certain value. Okay, you know, we are going to have a value here, which is what we call, they refer to us as a sum. Okay, we also do the same thing here. We multiply it by this. Then we, we are going to sum up those two values which we got. And we are going to sum them up. Then we are going to multiply them by minus 0 
are five eighths. So that is going to give us our efficacy, which is the re our response variable uh, in this uh, model. So that is just a flow. Uh, I think uh, they did explain further uh, in this uh, in this YouTube uh, video. Uh, they did explain. Let me drop it also in the chat. I think they did explain further in this uh, YouTube video. So it, when we sum that, the summation of these two plus multiply plus this value, so it's going to give us uh, the, the efficacy, which is the response variable. So they said uh, this is from the book, page uh, 406, and we can see all the past passages for calculating the estimated f of x, supposing that we know the value of the parameters. So here we have a very we have a very simple example where p being our number of predictors is equals to two input variable where we have our x1 and x2. We also have k, which is two hidden units, which we have h1 of x and h2 of x with gz of z square. We specify that the parameters are beta zero, which is equals to zero. We have our beta one, which is equals to one over four. We also have our beta two, which is equals to minus one over four. We also have our w10, which is zero, w11, which is one, w12, which is also one, then w20, which is zero, w21, which is one, and W22, which is uh, minus one. So from our equation 10.2, this means that H1 of X is equals to what zero plus X1 plus X2 raised to the power of two. Then the second hidden layer, okay, is equals to this, which is zero plus X1 minus X2 raised to the power of two. So then when we plug in 10.7, what we have here into 10.1, we get we get this other equation here. We are we we arrive at equation 10.10.8, which is given by this. So fitting a quantitative neural network to estimate the unknown parameters, the unknown parameter which is W, K, J, and beta K requires the square error loss from function to be to be minimum. Okay, so now looking at the mean squared mean squared error, so which is given by this equation, which is one raised to the power of n. We have y i minus f of x i raised to the power of uh, two, which is what we used to derive uh, the mean uh, square error. Uh, from the model. So, or we can also train a quantitative neural network uh, is to minimize the negative uh, multinomial log likelihood or the cross minus the word entropy. So we see this explained in the multi-layer uh, neural network section. So here we have the minimum of the negative uh, multinomial log likelihood, which is given by, which is given by this equation. So as deep learning models have the ability to fit a good switch lines uh, to the data, the estimated parameters can be, it can be applied to the special uh, soft max uh, functions or which was given by f of m, which is a probability of y is equals to m in uh, x, which is uh, given uh, by by this uh, equation, so so that is uh, basically uh, that for the uh, single layer uh, neural network. So I don't know if you have any uh, comments or before we proceed uh, to the next. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um... Okay, so here, yeah, this is uh, the first lab for the single layer network. Uh, we are using the ETAS uh, data sets. 
So here they will uh, how to perform deep learning. Our studio, we need we need these three uh, we need these three packages installed. Keras, we also need TensorFlow. We also need uh, Touch to be installed. But in the book, I think the book they they are so they gave some guideline on how we can set up uh, install these three in our in our machine. So here we are using the ISLR two package because this uh, package come with the with the ITAS uh, data sets. So we we'll only drop all the missing data. Then we are saving the data as GITAS. So we check for the number of rows, which we save, assign it to a variable called N. Then we set our random seed, which is 13. Then we look at our number of tests. Okay, here we are using the trunk function where we say the number of row divided by three. So this is the, the number of tests. Then we have the test ID, which is a sample of one to N. Then we pass in our number of tests. So here we are simply uh, fitting uh, the model. So here we have guitars. So we sub subset X written except the test ID. Then we have testing, which is guitars. Then we have test ID. So we fit uh, the model on the training uh, data set. So we do our prediction on the test sets. Then we bind uh, both the testing and also uh, the predicted uh, data sets together. So we use a C bind from base R. Then we look at the mean absolute of the, we look at the mean for the summary, which is around 254.6687, okay? So now we now standardize the matrix and fit the lasso using the glime nets. So here we have X, we have to scale our model dot matrix. So we have salary explained by every other predictors minus uh, one, then data, data is equals to, data is equal to, the guitars uh, data set, then the Y is gonna be salary, then the library we are using it to fit. We are, here we are trying to use the GlimeNet uh, package. So we use, we have to look for the CV of the GlimeNet where we have X minus uh, test ID. So we are fitting this on the test ID type is uh, the main, we just need to extract uh, the main absolute error uh, from the model. So here we are looking for the minimum uh, lambda, which is a C predict. So we use a predict function, then we look for the mean. So here the mean is now uh, 252.2994. So when we do the same thing using uh, for both Keras and Torch, okay? for both Keras and Touch. So yeah, they said the Keras requires some installation on our studio. So there are certain steps and in which we must follow before we can uh, install Keras on our machine. I think they did explain that in the actual uh, book itself. So yeah, we have library, ISL2, then we have to use the try catch function, then we remove package, Keras, TensorFlow, and also reticulate, then error, which is function of E. Then, then we now install, we now install uh, Keras on our machine. Then we now write this file, okay? We also write this out, we set the R environment file. Then we are sourcing the system file helpers installation.r from package ISLR2. Then we set up the reticulates that is Miniconda. Then for TensorFlow, then we now start, we now load uh, the packages we'll be using, which is Tidyverse, which is Keras, and also uh, TensorFlow. So we have Keras model sequential, and then the layer dense, the unit is equals to 50. The activation is 
ReLU, which is the rectified layer uh, units, then the input shape, number of call of X, and then drop layer dropouts for the layer dropout, the rate is 0 0.4, and then layer dense, the unit is equals to, to one. So for the touch example, they use the library uh, touch, library loss, which is for high level interface for touch. We also have library touch vision for data sets and image transformations. We also have touch data set for data set we are going to use. We also have Z lots. Then we have touch manual seed, which is, uh, we said a random seed, which is 13. Then we now fit uh, the model, okay? And within the model, we also specify the hidden units, okay? I think uh, there were some detail they did explain uh, in the touch lab, the lab for touch. So they did explain some other. So this is how uh, we fit the model using this forward function of X, where we say X self hidden and then self activation and then self dropout and self outputs to, to retrieve uh, the outputs. So the next, uh, we'll just look at the, the multi-layer uh, neural network. Since we have seen the single layer, the single layer which have the, uh, our inputs, which is our predictors, we have our hidden layer, then we have our outputs, which is our response. So for the multi-layer neural network, so it's similar to the single layer. So it's the same steps. So we still have our activation function. Okay. For the first, we also here we are going to have the two. Uh, this example they gave two activation function, but here, but here we are having two. We are having different uh, hidden layers. So we have our input layer, which is x one toward x six. We have hidden layer one and also hidden layer. Two. Then we have our output function, which is which shows that we have ten output layers because we have from f of o x to f of nine x, which is y nine. So we are going from y zero to to y nine. So we have ten uh, ten response available in which we can get out of this multi layer uh, neural uh, network. So so we have our input layer which is for which goes from x1 to xp we have two hidden layer which is l1 and also l2 and it has some other parameter which is like uh, w1 and also w2 we also have some uh, activation function there then we have 10 output layer which is f of ox which is yo which is the first uh, response variable we also have our f of f1 of x, which is y1, which is the second one. Then the tenth one is f9 of x, which is our y9. These are all the response are variable in which we are going to get out uh, of our of our neural network. So okay, so for the next now we look at they also they talk about uh convolutional neural networks. So they say that the convolutional neural network evolved for classifying images by recognizing specific features, distinguishing each particular object uh, class. I think in the book, uh, they did discuss an example where they have an image of a tiger, where they apply, they have an image of a tiger where they apply the convolutional neural uh, network. So what this does is that it's going to uh, identify certain few each of these futures, okay? It's gonna identify these futures, then it's gonna group these uh, futures. Yeah, it's gonna be eye, it's gonna be, is it ear, is it nose? Then it's going to match all this to give us our tiger. So you are, you are gonna feed in an image into the model so this is going to pick this image, is going to identify some certain features in those image, 
Then at the end, it's going to split these futures. Then at the end, it's going to classify them to give us our to give us a output. And that output is what we call the response variable. So this can be seen in hospitals. This also happens in hospital where we can go and do our scan. So we power we are and at the, that process in which we are doing our scan, we are scanning a certain thing. So we are passing something in. Okay. So the convolutional neural network is going to pick this input. What we are feeding in is what we can call uh, the inputs. That is the inputs because we are feeding the inputs uh, into the model. So once we are passing the inputs, it's going to identify certain uh, features in this input in which we are passing into the model. So at the end, it's going to group those inputs uh, and give us our outputs, which is the response. So that is how uh, that is how is done. So it's going to give us. So they say the networks first identifies low level features in the input image. These futures are then combined to form higher level futures. So it's going to identify lower level futures. Then it's going to combine these lower level futures to give us a higher level future. So these higher level futures, we group them to give us our outputs, which we will get back out from that model. So we say that convolutional filters determine whether the, a local future is present in the image. So we can have get different convolution filters in the first hidden layer. So typically, we apply the uh, rectified linear ReLU activation function. So then we pull, pulling layers reduce the size of the image by, by two in each direction and provide some location, provide some location, uh, Invariance. Okay, so so the next uh, part here, they were talking about uh, the recurrent uh, neural network. Okay, so this they said that this is a what predictive uh, model for sequential data in nature. So here we have x is a sequence. So, and we also have hidden layer is a, also a sequence, okay? Where we have our A1 to what AL, which we can call our activation function in our model. So each AL fits into the output layer and produces a predictions, which is our, which is our O, of L for Y, because Y is always our label output, which is our response uh, in which we are getting out uh, of our model. So this prediction, so which is O of L, which is our predictions, is given by this, uh, is given by this uh, equation, whereby the loss function is gonna be Y minus O of L all squared, okay? Which is now given by uh, which is now given by this uh, recurrent neural network uh, this function. So here we have uh, we have our x, okay, our x with being our inputs, okay. Within these inputs, there are some certain hidden layer and also activation uh, function that is going in, like a of l. We also have O, which is the predicted, uh, our, our prediction from the model and our Y, which is gonna be the output, which is our response uh, variable at the end, the outputs we get out of the model, which is equals to it. And the whole of this is equals to this. So we still start from here and we end here. We have X2, which is still the same thing. We have the second level activation function, O, O2, we have X3, so we get to XL, we have AL, we have B and W being our hidden unit, our predicted outputs, and this is now uh, this is now our, our response.
Okay, so let's play. Next slide. Okay, so this is talk just talking about uh the back propagation, back propagation, uh, which is they are still showing us uh, the same outputs where we have X, which is our our inputs predictors O to Y, which is Y being our response. So we still have it's still the same uh, thing, so I will not uh, waste more time because we still have our X1, we still have our W, B, and A1, and also O1. So with back provocation, the purpose is to get the values of weights, W, so that uh, it goes back uh, to look at weights and select the values of weights so that the mean squared error or mean absolute error is the minimum. So it keeps changing yes, yes. the weights so that we get uh, the minimum mean squared error. Yes, yes, perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so this part is uh, basically they are talking about uh, deep learning, the second part, where we'll be looking at uh, the multi-layer neural network then we'll look at a uh, convolutional neural network. Then we'll lo also look at recurrent uh, neural network. Then we we'll look at the case study using the times, uh, times uh, series. Okay. So for this, so we'll be exploring three powerful types of neural networks. So this multi-layer neural networks, we also look at uh, convo convolutional uh, neural network, okay? We also look at uh, recurrent uh, neural network. So they say that these three, this network have, have revolutionized various fields by the ability to learn complex patterns and make intelligent uh, predictions. So we have the multi-layer neural network. So what are we trying to achieve here? They say it, let, it begins with a multi Multi-layer neural, this, the network represents a fundamental building block in the field of uh, deep uh, learning. So it's the multi-layer neural network is a building block, like I, I can say is a foundation for the neural network. So unlike their simpler counterparts with only one hidden layer. So this one, there has more than one hidden layer. Multi-layer neural network consists of multiple hidden layers, okay? each containing a numerous interconnected unit called the neurons. So this uh, architecture enables them to learn intricate uh, representations of data and make highly accurate uh, predictions. So they say that the power of a multi-layer uh, neural network lies in their capabilities to approximate almost any functions with just a single leading layer containing a large number of neurons. They can effectively model complex relationship between input data and output uh, predictions. So I, however, the learning process becomes more manageable when we employ multiple hidden layers, each with a more modest number of neurons. This, uh, this layered structure allows the network to gradually learn and extract abstract futures from the input data, leading to enhanced performance and improve uh, generalization. So in practice, multi-layer neural network have demonstrated remarkable success in a wide range of applications, including image and speech recognitions, uh, natural language uh, processing, and even autonomous driving by leveraging the ability to learn from vast amounts of labeled data. This network excels at recognizing intricate pattern, uh, providing valuable, invaluable insights and making accurate uh, predictions. So now that we have solid understanding of a multi-layer neural network, so let's look at the convolutional uh, neural network, which is given as CNNs. So CNNs represent specialized type of neural network architecture that has revolutionized the field of computer visions 
inspired by human visual systems. CNNs are designed to process and understand visual data, such as images and videos with exceptional accuracy. So the convolutional neural networks, apart from other neural network architecture, is the ability to exploit the spatial structure of visual data. They achieve this by employing a unique operation called convolution, which involves the application of filters or kernels to extract local filters from the input. These filters act as future detectors, capturing patterns such as edges, textures, and shape at different scales. So the convolutional neural network also incorporates other essential components such as pooling layers, which then sample the extracted futures, reducing the network's partial dimensionality while retaining important information. So additionally, they also mentioned that connected layers at the end of network utilize these extracted futures to make high-level predictions. So one remarkable application of the convolutional neural network is in image classification by training on large data sets. Convolutional neural network can learn to distinguish between thousands of object classes with impressive accuracy. They can identify specific objects in images. They can recognize faces. They can detect anomalies in medical images and even analyze intricate details in satellite uh, imagery. So the versatility and power of the convolutional neural network extend beyond image uh, classification. So we can see that this CNN cuts across several disciplines. So from what we are seeing here. So they have also made a significant contribution to other tasks, including object detection, semantic segmentation, and image uh, generation. So the convolutional neural network continue to push the boundaries of what is possible in computer vision and have become an indispensable tool in various industries ranging from healthcare to self-driving cars. So having explored the wonders of convolutional neural network, so we can now dive into the world of recurrent uh, neural networks, so which is giving us the, the RNN ends. So we can see that recurrent neural network have emerged as a groundbreaking type of neural network capable of modeling sequential data and capturing temporal dependencies. So this makes them highly effective in analyzing and generating sequences such as natural language, text, speech, and time series data. So unlike feed forward neural network where information flows in a single direction from inputs to outputs, the recurrent neural network introduces feedback connections that allow information to persist uh, over, over time. So the next, so we can see that the case study for the recurrent neural network, which is the time series, is given the idea is to extract many short mini series of input sequence, which is given as our X, which is from X1 to what XL with a predefined length of L called the lag and a corresponding target, which is our Y, which is our response uh, variable. So the target is the value of the log volume, which is VT at a single time point, which is given as T, and the input sequence, which is X, is a series of three vectors, which is given as X epsilon of L, each consisting of three measurements of log volume, which is DJ, return and log volatility from the T minus L, T minus L plus one, to t minus one. And each value of time, which is t, makes a separate x, y pair for t running from l plus one to t. So the autoregression 
for the recurrent, the recurrent neural network has much in common with a traditional auto regression, which is linear model. So, but they both use the same response and input sequence of X of length L is equals to five and dimension, which P is equals at three in this case. So the recurrent neural network processes this sequence from left to right with the same weights. For while the autoregressive model simply treats all L elements of the sequence equally as a vector of L by P predictors. So a process called flattening in the neural network literature. So the, the RNN also includes the hidden layer activations A, which transfer information along the sequence and introduces additional non-linearity. Uh, so I think they did some example where they load the Tariverse and the ISLR2 uh, library. So they use the NYSE data and then they look at the head. So which is the giving us this. Then they use the data dot matrix a function to convert it to a matrix. So they pass in the data, then they pass in the DJ return, the log for the volume, the log for the volatility. We have the X data and then they look at they look at the head, which gave us a this. So each train, so pass in the train set, then they scale the data sets down the scale to have a mean of zero standard deviation one. So they now make a function to create a lag versions of the three time series. So they create uh, that this is a function. So, so now they now apply uh, they now apply the lags. So here they use the data frame. So the log of the volume is equals to X data. So log volume. So we have L1, we have L2, we also have L5. So, so this AR frame and then head, which is three, row three, column uh, three, which gave us uh, this, uh, and then the noun extract this for the train, for the train set. So the linear autoregressive model. So for the autoregressive stamp, AR stands for with auto, which include this. So they now fit the linear autoregressive model to the training data in this uh, form. Then they look at the summary of the outputs, which gave, which gave us uh, this. So they now, they now predict on the train, on the, they now predict, make prediction on the test set because they are negating the train. It's going to be the test set. So the full predicts, which is like a data frame, AR prep, lock volume, AR frame, not train, and lock of the volume. And then they now uh, visualize, uh, they now visualize the final output where we have the predicted and also the lock volume. So we can see a, one, a positive uh, correlation and the relationship was very uh, strong it's because we can see we have an R square of 0 0.41. So it means that 41% uh, percent of the variability uh, in the predicted variable is being explained uh, by the model. So we now add, we now add day of week into the model. So to add the day of the week, so they just, pass it in this way, then they have uh, AR frame, then they look at the head, so which gave us this, which is the first six row, then they now fit the model, they now run the predictions, so they now convert the predicted value into a data frame, so they now, they now create uh, the same uh, visualization again. So once we add uh, the time period, we now have predicted value, as against the lock of the volume. And, and we now see that our R square, when we added the day of the week, I think it went up to 0 0.459. So 
So we, we extract the mean value, which is around 0 0.459861. Uh, so they now did some pre-processing. They did some model uh, pre-processing. So to fit the re, uh, recurrent neural network, we, we reshape the data sequencing where L is equals to five, then the future vectors is equal to this for each observation. So uh, these are lab versions of the time series going by L times points, pre-processing step, okay? So they have number of rows from AR frame, then they convert the data into, into a matrix. So they look at the array, then, then EPERM function. So passing this, so they index uh, the data, then they look at uh, the dimension of this. So shows that they have total of this row uh, five and also three. So I don't get how do they arrive at, I think dimension is supposed to show the number of rows and also the number of column, but they are also having three. Maybe the number of layers. Okay. Because dime is supposed to show us the number of rows and also the no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the RNN model, for the RNN model, they fitted it using Keras. So they did it this way, uh, using reticulates. They set up the virtual, they create a new virtual environment for the Python. Okay. Then they rule library TensorFlow. Then they use virtual environment to be reticulates. Then we load our Keras library. Then we fit our model. Okay. We fit in our model. And um, this is the output we got from Keras. So we now, we now look at the mean square error. So for the model, we look at the mean square error. We look at the history of recurrent neural network model fits. So we look at the history. So we have model and then we fit, we fit uh, the model. Then at the end, at the end, we visualize it then using the loss and value loss. So we can see how we move from this point, 0 0.95, how, uh, how the model begin to decrease uh, over, uh, over, over time. So then when we look at the predicted value from the model, we can now see that our R square uh, dropped to uh, 0. Point, uh, it dropped to 0. Point for one. So for the second model, okay, for the second model two, where they added day of they added day of week into the model. So when they added day of week into the model and they now fit uh, the model with Keras, okay. So they now uh, they now visualize it. Uh, we can see that we have a semi. Uh, uh, we have a similar pattern, just as we did earlier on with the, the other uh, two, we have similar uh, pattern. Okay, so I think the last is the next, okay, it's just the meeting, previous uh, cohort uh, meeting video. Yeah, on the previous slide, I think the dimensions, the third thing was not the, uh, the number of hidden layers because it was before uh, fitting the model. That was, uh, uh, I think, there are three matrices that are created. Uh, so there are number of rows, number of columns, and then there are three matrices because it is sequential. So I guess these are three matrices that we get. It's uh, in 10.10. 10. Um, Let me check. Uh, it's uh, down below um, where they show the plot first. Uh, the next topic. Oh, yeah, below below this in the B processing part. Yeah. So here, yeah. The, yeah. the dimensions is, so if we have the AR frame 
data set and then it is uh, transformed into a matrix. Okay. So we have uh, those rows and columns and then three, I think, arrays are created. Uh, okay. array, array itself is uh, is a three-dimensional object here. So the first dimension is number of rows, the second is number of columns, and the number three is uh, the number of matrices that are created because it is sequential data. This is what I understand. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, that's all. So let me stop.